we're seeking to <clears throat> expose the lies of the enemy and to understand the truth. As followers of Jesus Christ, and if you're not yet a Christian, if you choose to follow him, we understand that, that his word reveals his truth. And our world has a whole different message for us because it's led by the enemy of your soul. Our world is influenced by the enemy, and so lies come through. So last week we talked about the lie that your sin won't cost you and your sin won't catch you. We can just go on sinning, do what we want, and it's not going to make any difference. And the Bible says something very, very different. It says that Jesus came and died because of our sins, because they're so serious, because they're such a big deal. At the end of the message last week, I asked people, and, and we here at Shoreline, when we invite someone to, to surrender their heart and follow Jesus, we don't, we don't kind of do a sort of a, well, if you maybe kind of don't know if you did, and you maybe sort of want to, and you kind of want to know Jesus, then you can kind of sort of maybe, we're real clear. If you've never received Jesus, you've never come to the cross and confessed your sin and received his grace, and this is your day, pray today. And I want to let you know this morning that there were four people online last week who became part of the family of God by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. Yeah, amen. And then there were four people on our campus who for the first time received Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. And all of them are receiving a Bible, a 50-day reading plan, and starting, starting that journey of growth. But you only understand the grace of Jesus if you acknowledge the lie. And that lie, we looked at last week, was that, that your sin won't catch up with you and it won't cost you. And when we face the, face the lie, we can then understand the truth. Well, today, we're going to be talking about another lie, exposing another lie of the enemy, of our souls. And here's that lie. My worth is defined by the world. My worth, my value, who I am and how important I am, it's defined by this world. And I'm here to tell you that is a lie from the pit of hell. That is an absolute lie. Our world doesn't define who we are, but, but oftentimes we buy into it because we have this constant this infusion and this constant kind of, kind, of, kind of crashing waves of culture telling us things. Uh, people who study these sorts of things, I'm not one of them, but I, I read people's research. One study showed that the average American in a lifetime, the average American in an average lifetime will watch over 35,000 hours of advertisements. Pop-ups on your phone, billboards that you see. Over 35,000 hours of these messages coming in saying, this is what makes you important. This is what makes you valuable. Drive this car and, oh, you are in. You don't have that car? Guess what? You're not. Look like this, act like this, talk like this, and you're, there's all these messages coming in. 35,000 hours of messages. Some of them neutral, some of them even maybe positive, but a lot of them very, very negative. And the enemy kind of infuses those to bring those lies to our hearts. Another study shows that the average teen in America, the average teen in America right now, today, spends nine hours daily on video entertainment, online entertainment, social media, um, watching videos, YouTube, those sorts of things, playing video games, nine hours in a normal day. That's not in a week, that's in a day. And within that is, is, are messages that are coming to them, that are shaping them and forming them. And so, and so we have to understand the lie that, that our, who we are, our value, is not established by this world. Our world sends ever-changing and damaging messages all the time, again and again and again. And you know, it's not just for children, and not just a concern for teens. Grown-up, mature adults, even adults who know Jesus, we can buy into the lie. And we start to look at ourselves through the eyes of the world. And we look at ourselves as less than and not enough and not loved and not significant. And those lies from hell can damage us. In John chapter 8, Jesus is talking to a group of people and, and many of these people are people who are, are putting their faith in him or starting to follow Jesus, but they're still caught by the lies of their culture. They're still believing the lies of the enemy. And so Jesus wants to clarify that the one who's influencing them, the one who influences this world, needs to, we need to understand his character and what he's about. So in, in John chapter 8, verse 44... Jesus says to these people, and again, these are people who are spiritually seeking or are starting to find him, but they're still believing the lies of the enemy. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Oh, gentle, gentle Jesus. Always gentle, always sweet, never conviction, right? No, he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Jesus is revealing the lie because he wants them to know the truth. So he says of Satan, of the enemy, he says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. There's no truth in Satan. 
When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Every time lies are present in some way, the enemy is working. And here's one of the lies that far too many of us, even people who have come to the cross and received Jesus, far too many of us believe this. My worth is defined by what the world tells me, the messages of this world. And if you believe that, if you buy into that, the end is destruction, depression, death, confusion, self-hatred, and an inability to understand what God says about us because we're hearing so much from the world. And so what I want to do is I want to expose these lies of the enemy and give you some pictures just in your own mind to begin to recognize, am I buying into the lie? Am I believing the lie of the enemy, the father of lies that he's saying about me? So here's exposing the lie. Here's one of the ways that 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 lie manifests itself. Your worth is defined by your physical appearance. Your worth is defined by how you look at any given moment. And, and, And so we spend time trying to make ourselves look a certain way. We spend time thinking, well, what will people think about how I look? We spend a lot of time thinking about those things. And we buy products and different things to help us feel like we look the way we need to look to feel good about ourselves because our worth is defined by how we look. And then we discover the uphill battle that when you hit 30, 35, 40, all of a sudden, it's harder just to look like you. (laughs) You know? It takes extra time and extra work just to, to, it's like I'm paddling upstream, right? And, And there's this battle going on. And we can start to look at ourselves and think, I'm just not worth much. I don't look like I used to look. I'm not cut like I used to be cut. I don't have the same, you know, and, and, and we believe the lie that that defines who we are. And, and, and so we, we go to the mirror and we do our enhancements and we take lots of time and, and, and we, we work this. But here's the truth. You're not defined by your exterior appearance. If, if you believe what this book says, Now, I understand for many people, you get this 30 minutes a week and you get the other stuff dozens of hours a week feeding that into your mind. One of the reasons why we need to open this book and read it every day to hear God's truth, to hear God's truth, to hear, to counteract that, 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 just that tide of lies coming our way. But too many of us believe the lie that we're defined by how we look. So we start to devalue ourselves because we don't look the way we think we should. Exposing the lie. Your worth is defined by your wealth, your address, and your stuff. How much do you have? Where where do I live? What vehicle do I drive? And go ahead and put some put some of those images up there. Just uh, you know, we we can start saying, I I need to I need to live that life. I need to fight for that life. The problem is even material things. That that there's diminishing returns. I know people who have lots of material things and are very happy, and have lots of material things and are not very happy. I know people who have very modest means who are very happy and people who have very modest means and they're not happy at all. But the world will tell you if you can accumulate more, get more, and live a certain way, a certain standard, then then not only will it make you happy, but that defines your worth. I am a valuable person because of my bottom line net worth. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Nothing wrong with having stuff, nothing wrong with taking care of that stuff, but that doesn't define you. It doesn't say who you are unless you let it, and you shouldn't. Exposing the lie. Your worth is defined by your intellect, your IQ, or your education. Many people believe that, that, that boy, my net worth, you know, I mean, I mean, my, my worth as a person, my value as a person is my ability to figure stuff out. It's how I think. It's how I see the world. And is there anything wrong with good education? No. Is there anything wrong with exercising your mind and using it well? We should. But that doesn't define who you are. Your worth is not based on on your ability to think. Because if it is, there comes a point, there comes a point where you start forgetting your points. (laughs) Right? There comes a point where you go, ah, I know you're my daughter. What's your name again? Uh, (laughs) there, there There comes a point where it, So all of a sudden now, because my mind's not working like it did before, because my intellect's not the way it was, I'm no longer valuable? My worth is going down? Don't believe the lie. Your worth is not based on how intellectually advanced you are. There's something more going on. And God's word has something to to say to us about this. Exposing the lie. Your worth is not defined by your group identity. 
This, this has become a massive issue in the last five to ten years in our culture. I'm part of this group and you're part of that group. I'm better than you. People used to say that was a horrible way to think about things. Now it's becoming a very common way to think. I'm part of this group and you're part of that group, therefore we can't like each other. All, all this group identity stuff. My, my worth is not based on whatever group you put me in. And there's, there's, there's dozens of kind of groups you can put me in. You know, but, but you can say, well, that's, now that's your, your worth is defined by what group you're part of. No, that's not what God's word says. There's more to who you are. Exposing the lie. Your worth is defined by your social media friends and followers. Your, your value, your worth is based on how many people follow you, how many people call you, you know, who, who click that they're your fan, how many people you know, clap or thumbs up or, or tell you, boy, what you're doing, you know, you're, you're wonderful in that, in that virtual world of social media. And I'll tell you what, right now, there are children and there are youth and some adults who feel that they are not worth anything because they live in that world. And that world keeps telling them, you know, you, you're, just, you're just not worth much. There's, there's young people who have considered or even taken their lives because they feel so unworthy and worth nothing because of that whole world. If social media de- determined your worth, I would have zero worth. I got on social media years ago and I lasted for 15 minutes. I'm not kidding. I said to my son, Josh, who's you know, kind of a techie kind of guy, I said, you know, Josh, do I, should I look into this thing? And it, you know, social media was kind of becoming a bigger thing. And I said, well, you know, put me on this one of these primary platforms. So he, he signed me up. He got me, all, you know, got me all signed up. And within like 10 minutes, I had five or six like pings of people who are now, oh, hey, now you're part of this community. And hey, and, and, and I said to him, I said, Josh, am I supposed to respond to these? Like it's a, a real person talking to me and I'm supposed to like, it would be rude. Like if someone sends me an email, I respond. Do I have to respond to these? He goes, well, yeah, that's kind of the polite thing to do. And I said, make it go away. Um, <laughs> I go people I hadn't seen for like 15 years and I'm like, I don't, I, I don't have time for my friends right now. And so I, I actually, so, so I don't live in that world. Therefore, my worth is zero. Right? Mind and Sherry's publisher has, both our, our publishers have told us for years, you need to have a presence on social media, you need to have a fan base, you need to have all these followers, and that way you, know, you can sell more books and stuff. And I'm like, no. So I guess my worth is zero, because I have zero footprint in the social media world, right? No! Because my net worth and my value is not what social media says, and neither is yours. And if you're believing that, you're believing lies from the enemy, from the pit of hell. Don't believe the lies because there is so much more to who you are. There's more to who you are than what you're worth or where you live or how you look or how many fans or friends you have in social media. So Jesus, this is our prayer. As we get ready to open your word, as we, begin, as we get ready to listen to your voice, my prayer is that the lies of the enemy, you would just shine light on them. And that we would see them for what they are. They're deceitful, destructive, deadly lies from the pit of hell. And I pray that we will say we are not listening to those lies. And as we look at your word, Jesus, as we look at your word and we discover what, what you say about who we are, what our value is, that our worth is defined by what you say about us, Jesus, d- drive that deep into our souls. I want to pray that there's people today online and on this campus who will be set free from the lies of the enemy and released to new life and new joy and new hope in the power of the Spirit of God through the truth of the Word of God. Lord, speak to our hearts. Open our ears to hear, our minds to understand what you want to say, and our lives to be transformed by your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. We absolutely have to embrace the truth. And I need to tell you, that truth is found in this book. This book counteracts all the lies that I shared with you, uncovering those, all this, the truth of God's word counteracts all of those things. There's a reason why we challenge you every week. We, we put every week, we put together a Bible reading guide to get you ready for the next Sunday's message. It's on our website. It's on the Shoreline app. If you, don't, if you can't find it, call the church. We'll help you find it. But we, we say, open this book every day because when you, you got people in, the, in a lifetime, I mean, 35,000 hours of, of the waves crashing on your life, telling you what makes you valuable, what makes you good enough, what makes you bad, what may, all this stuff coming your way from the world, ultimately from the enemy, because when lies are there, the enemy is close by. With all that, we have to have an influx of truth, sup, 
Something has to fight that. And can I tell you something? 30 minutes a week on your pastor's sermon is not enough to counteract all the garbage coming your way. No matter how much you like the preaching, no matter how strong the sermon is, it's not enough for the daily just pounding of all the lies of the enemy and the lies of this world. And so we challenge you to open this book. We challenge you to read. We have Bible studies. and our, We teach kids here to read the Bible and, and youth. And we, we try to raise the value of that because that's the truth that transforms us and that fights against the lies of the enemy. So I want to talk about embracing the truth. I want to help you understand from the word of God who you are. And, and for some, some of these things are true for all of human beings, even if you haven't received Jesus. There's things that God says are true of you. Other things are true once you come to the cross and receive Jesus. But, but you need to understand who you are to counteract the lies of the enemy. So embracing the truth. First is this. You, are, you have been made in the image of the God of all creation. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, God made you in his image. Listen to these words from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. This is the first book of the Bible, the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Men, you have been made in the image of the living God. Women, you have been made and shaped in the image of the living God. And when men and women function together the way God's designed, it reveals his image and his presence. There's something powerful in that. There's truth in that. When you look in the mirror, I don't know what you think first thing in the morning when you look in the mirror. It, it might be just, Lord, help me. And it's like, okay, i got to start working. You know, but, but what you should understand is I've been made in the image of the living God. That's who I am. Whatever I look like on any given day, whatever I feel like, made in the image of God, both men and women, reflections of God, but not our, phys not our physical bodies. God is spirit. So, so what does it mean to say we're made in the image of God? It means to say we have the capacity to create. God is the creator God. We can create things, whether it's through art or through science or through mathematics. You, know, you can make things, create things, and, and you, you know, build, build a family. God says, you, I've made you to be creative. You're made in the image of God. You can do good. You can show grace to people. That's the image of God. You can love like God loves. That's the image of God. You, we can forgive. We can forgive those who's wronged us like God and Jesus forgave us. We've been made in the image of the living God. That's who you are. What defines you is not how much money you have, where you live, how your body's feeling in any given day, how you happen to look that day. Your, your, your intellectual capacity, those things don't define who you are. God does. And God has made you in his image. Embracing the truth. You are called a child of the living God. When you put your faith in Jesus, there, there's an overall sense that God has made all of us, but there's a way that we become God's children in a unique way when we put our faith in Jesus. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we read these words. Yet to all who did receive him, this is receiving Jesus, to those who believed in his name, the name of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. If you've come to the cross and received Jesus, those eight people that became Christians last Sunday in our church services, are, are now sons and daughters of the living God in a whole different way. And when God is your father, when you understand this, you understand, you have to understand that you are loved more than you can comprehend. Your heavenly father loves you more than you imagine. You are provided for every day. We, you know, we may work hard, we may have lots of other things that you know, kind of touch our lives, but at the end of the day, God is the one who provides for us. You're protected. That God watches over you and protects you day after day after day, more than you recognize or know until one day you're in glory. When you know that you're a child of God, you know that the door is open and you're welcome all the time. You're always welcome. Why? Because he's your father and you're his daughter. You're his son. And you recognize that. You embrace that. I've had kind of a policy in my life since, since Sherry and I had children. Our, our children are now all in their, in their young to middle 30s. We have three boys. But their whole childhood growing up, if any of my boys would call me during my work day, whatever I was doing, if my phone was on and if I saw it, it was them calling, I answered whatever was going on. Now, if I was like in the middle of like intense pre-marriage counseling, my phone's off. There's certain times I turn off. But if my phone's on and I see it's them, I'm going to answer. And now that I have grandkids, I'm going to do the same thing. You want to know why? Because those are my kids. Those are my grandkids. 
and I have a certain kind of relationship with them. As a matter of fact, this last week, I was meeting with Pastor Brandon. We were sitting in my office, working on some church stuff and meeting together, and my phone rings, and it's a FaceTime. It's a, it's a video chat, and I see that it's from my son, Nate, who lives in Michigan. So when I see a FaceTime from my son, Nate, I know it's not Nate calling because he texts me or he calls. With his, he calls. He doesn't FaceTime. I know it's Cohen or Piper, probably Cohen. It's one of my grandkids. I'm in the middle of this meeting with one of Shoreline's pastors. So I turn to Brandon and say, hey, Brandon, you're not important right now. I didn't say that. But I, just, I, I said, Brandon, just hang on for a couple minutes. I think it's my grandson. I've got to take care of this. He says, okay. He kind of sits back, and I put up the phone, and it's Cohen. And he wants to share about something that's going on in his life. He's four years old. And, and I'm thinking, whatever time this takes, I'm here for him. Because that's my grandson. I do the same thing with my boys. That's how God sees you. He's never too busy. He never puts you on hold. When you cry out to him, when you call to him, he hears you. You want to know why? Because you're his daughter. His beloved daughter. And you're precious to him. Because you're his boy. You're his son. That's the heart of God. That's what this book says about who you are. You need to know that. And don't believe the lies of the enemy. Embracing the truth. You are as valuable as the sacrifice that was made for you in the gift of Jesus. You can know that you are as valuable and precious as what was given to you. And what God the Father gave to you and for you was his only beloved precious son. When God the Father recognized the only way to cleanse us of our sins and give us new life and set us free from the enemy was someone to die in our place for our sins. His only precious son, Jesus, paid the price. That's how much God loves you. That's how precious you are. The best gift ever given in the history of the world. And, and we, we, sort of, we sort of understand this, that you can tell about a relationship sometimes by the gifts that people will give to you. I was thinking, as I was working on the sermon, I was thinking back to the last, just kind of through my life, and thinking, what are different gifts that God has brought through other people? And Sherry's given me wonderful gifts, and I've had family give me wonderful gifts. But I was thinking, as I was thinking about this, I had one gift come to my mind that just said something to me, and I've never forgotten it. On my 50th birthday, and I'm, I'm, I'm creeping extremely close to my 60th birthday now, so this is 10 years ago. On my 50th birthday, a friend of mine gave me a beautiful, clear, this couple, this couple gave me this beautiful, clear vase. He said, well, why is that so important to you? Well, this beautiful, clear vase was filled with 50 golf balls. Brand new ones, not used ones, like not taken out of a river or a pond somewhere. And they were pro V golf balls. If you're not a golfer, you know what that means. But that's the golf ball that I play. And so somebody gave me this vase instead of flowers, which would have meant nothing to me. Um, they gave me, and they actually gave me all the boxes so I could put the balls back in the box afterwards. But they, they gave me this display. I actually still have it in my office at home, my home office, but it's filled with all old crummy golf balls that are not usable anymore. Right? But the good ones I. I used the next week or two, they were gone. No, but, I, but, but here's what went through my mind. This person, no, I don't have many hobbies. The, kind, of the, kind of the one thing I do for fun is I like to play golf. That's kind of my one break in life, and just to go and do some fun. They knew that. They gave a gift that mattered to me, but, but they, gave, they knew exactly the kind of golf ball I play and gave me that. It was, it was just, it just, you go, that's 10 years ago. Why does that matter? Because here's what it said to me. You are valued. You matter to me enough to pay attention and to take the time and to give you something that I think you would really be blessed by. I'll never forget that, right? Well, the God of the universe looked at you and said, here's my best gift. My son, Jesus. His life to wash away your sins. His wounds and his stripes to make you whole. Oh, how we are loved. What defines me is not how much stuff I have. It's not my social media followers because I don't have any of those. But the God of the universe gave the best gift in all the universe for me and for you. Define yourself as God defines you. See yourself as God sees you. Embracing the truth. You are or could be a royal priest of the living God. If you grew up Catholic or Lutheran or, or Episcopal, you're like, well, no, no, priests are priests, and then there's the people in the church. But the Bible says if you come to faith in Jesus, you become one of his royal priests. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. We read these words. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, 
a holy nation, God's special possession. This is who you are in Jesus, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's the truth of Scripture. When you put your faith in Jesus, you don't need a priest or a pastor. You don't need me to come to God Almighty. Jesus has opened the way. And when you become a follower of Jesus, you become part of his royal priesthood, and you can walk right into the presence of God Almighty. And so when you understand who you are in Christ, you understand you have access to God, but you also understand that you have a ministry. When you put your faith in Jesus and he says you are a royal priesthood, it means you've got things to do. God has gifted you and called you. For some people, there's people right now holding the littlest kids who are part of Shoreline in the Shoreline's nursery, and their ministry is holding those little kids and praying for them and loving them while you're in church. That's their ministry. Praise the Lord. Other ones of you work with our high school students, our middle school students, involved in our, in our young adult ministries. There's Bible study teachers. There's, you, you have a ministry. Maybe that ministry is just raising children that will love Jesus and not go crazy in our crazy world. But when you're a follower of Jesus, he says, you have full access to the Father, and I have something for you to do with your life. Some way to use your gifts for his glory and for his good. What a privilege. That, that's who I am. I'm a servant of the living God. I'm a priest, a whole, part of God's holy priesthood. Embracing the truth. You are or could be a friend of God. When you put your faith in Jesus, you're not just a child of God. You're called a friend of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Verses 15 and 16, we read these words. Jesus is speaking. Here's what Jesus says. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, Jesus says, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, Jesus says, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. Friendship's about intimacy and connection and affection. And Jesus says, you are my friend. When it starts to get in your soul, if, if you can push away the lies of the enemy, and maybe the way you've seen yourself for the longest time, and you can start each day and say, I've been made in the image of the living God. I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a son of God. God has paid the ultimate price to call me his own. I'm a friend of God. When you start to understand who you are, it changes everything. But you have to push away the lies and identify the lies. God is the creator and the sustainer of all life. So trust his word. You've got, you've got to believe this book more than what the world tells you. Because what the world tells you will beat you down and what God's word tells you will lift you up. You'll discover who you are and here's the beauty of it. Nothing and no one can change that. In, 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 in every other area, this world says this is, what, this is what makes you valuable. It can come and go overnight. Whatever you do, don't check and see what your retirement account has done in the last three months. Because it's changed and probably not for the better. Uh, I'm, 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 I guess I'm worthless now. I guess I'm, I'm worth what those numbers say. No. If you're a child of God, a friend of God, made in his image, you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, and you're his royal priest, you have dignity and a reason to live every day of life. And when, this, when you understand these things, then we begin to engage in God's good life. Now we can, when we get this, we can live the good life that God has laid out for us and planned for us. How do you engage in God's good life? You treat yourself with dignity and respect like Jesus does. Jesus gave his life for you. So you treat yourself with dignity and respect. You see yourself through the eyes and the lens of Jesus. This is not an arrogant thing. It's not a prideful thing. But I can stand here and say to you, I am a child of the living God. And if you come to the cross and receive Jesus, so are you. And if you haven't received Jesus and you do receive him, he will call you his child. He will call you his friend. He will call you a royal priest. So view yourself the way God views you, not the way the world sees you. Because the way the world sees you will never get better. But the way God sees you will never change. And when you can see yourself through those eyes, it makes a world of difference. I have friends that at times will talk badly about themselves. They'll beat themselves up. They'll say horrible things about themselves and put themselves down. 
You know how I respond to that when someone does? If a friend of mine says something bad about themselves, I'll say, hey, don't talk about my friend that way. I say, don't, don't, you, you know, I care about you. Talk about yourself the way God talks about you. And then the next thing makes perfect sense. Engaging in God's good life means we treat others with dignity and respect like Jesus does. We treat other people with the same dignity and respect that Jesus does. People who know Jesus and people who don't yet know Jesus. And can I tell you, in the last probably five to seven years, I have never seen anything like this in in my lifetime. And even looking at history, I don't know if there's been a time quite like this right now. But there is this thinking that is so perverse and so demonic and so from the pit of hell that says, if we disagree on something, we hate each other. What a lie from the pit of hell. You can disagree with someone. You can have a fiery conversation about something and still love them. I tell people, I know you can disagree with other people and still love them because I'm married. (laughs) And my wife and I disagree on a daily basis about something. I'm not kidding. But I love her and she loves me. Don't believe the lie from the pit of hell that if someone is on the opposite side of the aisle from you or the line from you or whatever people are defining. I mean, our, our world and Satan is having a heyday. Whisper, if that person disagrees with you, they're now your enemy and they hate you and you have to hate them. That's from the pit of hell. I have dear friends that I disagree with. We can have really good, robust conversations and disagree and, and say, but we love each other. And that's the way the world was until about five or seven years ago. Seriously. People had strong disagreements and still got along. And enemy, the enemy is just getting in there and dividing us. Don't play into his hand. So, so not only look at yourself and say, I have dignity, I have value because I was made in the image of God. Even someone that's not a follower of Jesus, they're made in God's image. But say, I also want to give you that dignity. So even if we disagree and see the world differently, I can still love you and respect you. I may not agree with you, but I can still love you in the name of Jesus. I I love how Jesus put together his disciples. Do a study sometime on this. Fisherman, okay, tax collector, zealot. If you know the, the first century, the tax collectors and the zealots wanted to kill each other, literally, literally. We would, 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 would go not just into physical fights, but they could actually take each other out. And Jesus says, okay, as I'm putting together my group of disciples, let's make sure we got a little bit of this and a little bit of that. <laughs> let's keep it interesting, right? But he taught them to love each other, even though they, they were learning to understand each other. And, and so we have to show dignity to other people. And then, and then, engage in God's good life, seek justice and fairness in the name of Jesus. And let me be really clear. When I say justice, I don't mean social justice. I mean biblical justice. Social justice is a whole different topic. It's kind of the world's view of a justice. And the world's view of justice oftentimes is actually injustice. But we go after biblical justice. Where, where God tells us how to love people and care for people that are outcast. Pastor Keith brought a great message on, on kind of adoption and the forgotten. And people, you know, ch- children that are forgotten, that are, that are orphaned. And he brought, did a great job. If you didn't hear that message, go online and listen to it. It was powerful. You know, we have to have a, heart, a place in our heart for those who are broken and forgotten and outcast. To show the love and the grace of Jesus. We can, we, we can seek the justice that God calls us to seek because that's the heart of God. Engaging in God's good life. Treat others as you want to be treated. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How do I treat other people? Okay, when, I, when I know who I am, when I know that I am made in the image of God, I'm a child of God, I'm a friend of God, I'm one of God's royal priests, God paid the ultimate price to call me his own. When I, when I understand that, I can now treat others in a way that I can't do in my own power. I don't, have, I don't have the strength to care for people the way I should, but if I care for people out of who I am in Christ and what he's done in me, I can love and care for people in ways I could never do in my own power. And then engaging in God's good life. Share your stories of God's presence and power whenever you can. When you know who you are, when you stop believing the lies that my, my net worth, you know, my net worth defines my worth before the world, not true. When, when you no longer believe that how I look any given day defines my worth, when you don't believe all those lies, when you recognize who you are in Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, and I want to say if you're not yet a Christian, his arms are open. He's in, in, God, God is waiting for anyone who will turn to him and receive him. And, but, but if you say, I put my faith in Jesus, and I, say, I know who I am. So now I have stories to tell. You can tell people your stories about God's presence in your life and God's power. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, and you pause right now, and I say, okay, in the last week or two, could you tell me one or two stories of how God has shown up in your life? My guess is that almost every one of you can. I was fearful in this moment, and God gave me comfort and strength. 
I didn't have the strength to push through this, but God carried me through. I couldn't have the wisdom to figure out the situation, but God gave me the wisdom I needed. Whatever it was that God showed up, God did something. You have stories to tell. When you know who you are in Christ, you can share your stories with other people, with Christians and with people that don't know Jesus. And here's one of the beautiful things. One of the things in our world today is that, and this goes back to the sermon Pastor Dennis preached in the in series just before the series about truth. You know, people today believe that they can make up their own truth and my truth, your truth, but we understand there's, there's God's truth. But, but when, when we understand that, when we, when we look at people and we, we recognize that, um, that, that every, you know, every person... And I just, I've done this in a long time. I was thinking about Dennis and my mind went totally blank on what I was going to say, which is okay. Will you still love me if I go blank during a sermon? Good. Uh, because, because my worth is not based on that either, right? Um, but oh, but, but, you, can, but you, can share, you can share your stories of God's presence and God's power. And in our world today, uh, you know, Pastor Dennis was talking about truth. And, and our world today will say things like this. Well, you know, I may disagree with what you believe, but I'm not going to question your experience. So what we can do is we can tell stories about what we've experienced. I, I can tell stories. You can tell stories about God, how God comforted you, how God strengthened you, how God led you through a time that you thought you could never get through. And people aren't going to say, if, if you say to somebody, this is what I experienced, they're not going to say, no, you didn't. They're going to actually wonder, could I experience that too? Somebody who says, I was so lonely, and I went through this deep loss. But God came near me, and he was my comfort, and he was my strength, and I felt his arms wrapped around me, and I'm, and I'm making it through. It's tough, but I'm making it through day by day. No one's going to say to you, God doesn't do that. They're going to say, well, that's great for you. But I wonder if that same God could do that for me. You have stories to tell about the presence and the power and the work of God in your life. Share those stories freely. Final thought. God can use you to bless others in greater ways than you can dream. When you know who you are, when you read this book, and you stop believing the lies of the enemy and the lies of the world, and you understand who you are through Jesus Christ, God can then flow his love and flow his grace and flow his truth through you. Because you're not spending every day trying to feel like you're worthy and worth something. You're not fighting the d diminishing returns of I have less money, I don't look as good, I'm not as strong, I can't do things the way, I don't think the way I used to think. My value is going down, 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 down. And God says, no, I determine who you are. I made you, I love you, and you are worthy because of that. And guess what? No one can take that away. Amen? Amen. Nobody. So Jesus, this is our prayer. Our prayer is that we would be people who do not let the world define who we are and what we're worth that we would not believe the lies of the enemy, that this world just sort of beats down on us. But Jesus, we would look to you and look to your word. And I want to pray for every person who's part of this congregation, whether they're online or on campus, who has come to the cross, who has received Jesus, that this day, you, that God, you would silence the lies of the enemy and you would remind them that you would whisper in their ear or scream into their soul, they are made in your image. They are children of God. They are friends of God. They are part of a royal priesthood that you paid the ultimate price out of love for them. Let every person who names the name of Jesus who's part of Shoreline Church walk in that boldness and confidence. And God, I pray for anyone who does not yet know your love and your grace and the forgiveness of Jesus that this day they would say, I'm tired of believing the lies of the world and riding that roller coaster of how I see myself. But Jesus, if you could define who I am and strengthen me, and if, if I truly am all that we've talked about from your word today, if I put my faith in you, then Jesus, I want to know more about you. And if that's you, talk to one of your friends or one of the pastors here and say, I want to learn more about Jesus. I want to figure, out the, figure this thing out because it's too important to put off. Jesus, lead us forward as people confident in who we are because of what you have taught and what you have declared. Let us walk in that confidence, we pray in your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 Before I send you off with a word of blessing, and before I have you stand in just a moment, I want to give a couple of important invitations. There's three things that you need to be aware of that are really important. One is, if you're part of the military or if you're a family of military, 
um, right after the service, when you go out of the worship center, or if you're in the courtyard, you'll see over by the food pantry over in this part of the, of the parking lot, there's a whole area set up for military to kind of connect, to have some refreshments. So if you're connected to the military, family of the military, go there before you leave and just connect and meet some folks that are part of the military and part of Shoreline Church. Also, this Wednesday is the best Wednesday of the month. It's night of worship, and we're going to have a great message, a great time of communion, and a great time of learning together. So join us at 6.15. There's also children's programming going on uh, during that time. So come join us at 6.15 for night of worship. And then one more thing. If, for all the men and all the boys in our church, we're having a tailgating party. We're planning on 250 to 300 people being here. And it's going to be fun and football, and food, and faith, and an amazing time. There's going to be competitions for students and for adults. We're going to have that, that big screen out there. It's going to be uh, Super Mario Kart and different things that we had at our... At, you know, it's, going to be, it's going to be an amazing night, and so we invite you to come be part of that. Go out to the courtyard, if you're on campus here, and just sign up and say, I want to know more about it. We've got to get a count. Are we 250 or 400? Because we have to have enough food for everybody. So just let us know if you're coming. If you're online... Go online and register. Again, if it doesn't work out that you make it or not, that's okay. But if you plan on being here, let's get, get us within 50 for the food so we can make sure we got enough for everyone. All right? And then if you need prayer for anything right now, joys or needs, we have folks up in the front over here. Over here, it looks like we have three, four different teams here. If you need prayer in, your, in the worship center, come forward at the end of the service. If you're out in the courtyard or if you're in the family worship venue, our prayer team is out by the big screen TV. If you're online, our prayer team is online. You can call the phone number and someone will answer and pray with you or you can use the text, uh, the email and send us your prayer needs and we'll put them on our prayer list. And finally, if you're new at Shoreline, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're online, just text the word welcome to the number you see and we will reach out to you and get to know you personally. If you're on campus, go to the Connection Center right there inside the lobby here and they want to give you a gift bag. Thank you for coming and just answer your questions about Shoreline Church. So don't leave without connecting with us because we want to get to know you. If you're able to stand online on campus, please stand with me. And just quiet your heart and receive this word of blessing. As we close this time together, reject, deny, identify, and call out the lies of the enemy. Don't believe his lies about who you are, about your value, about your worth. But may your heart and mind be filled with the truth of Scripture. Go into the rest of this week with your heart knowing if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, you are a child of God. You are a friend of God. You are a royal priesthood. You are beloved by God. He sacrificed his best gift for you. Walk in his power, walk in his presence, and overflow with his love everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you Wednesday night, 615, night of worship, and next Sunday. Have a great week.